good it is to know that our God continues to prove himself faithful. I thank God for this privilege and opportunity to share what I believe the Lord has laid on my heart as we continue in a journey that we began last week trying to describe in detail what it means to walk by faith. Tonight, as we pick up in part two of that series, I'm going to invite you to yet another instance in the life of Jesus where we find faith at work. A text that's tailored to teach us what it truly means to put our faith in God and to apply it in our daily living. I invite you tonight to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the very first book of the New Testament. In the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we find another instance of great faith. Matthew chapter 14, I want to begin our reading out of the New King James Version in verse 22, and ask those who are physically able to stand with us as together we reverence the authority and the anointing of God's holy word from Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning in the 22nd verse. Hear the word of the Lord in an instance that may be familiar to many. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it must be a ghost. They cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's really you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Do me a favor. Give somebody tonight's sermon title. Look at him. Show him you brushed all your teeth before you came to church. (laughs) Tell him, Neighbor, Neighbor, don't be scared. scared. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Don't be scared. Continuing on the foundation of what was laid last week, I believe without argument and with full unanimous agreement, we could say in this church family today that it is almost virtually impossible to overestimate the value of faith. Faith is at the core of your relationship with God, for it is by grace that we're saved through faith. As a matter of fact, you can't walk daily with God without faith, for the Bible teaches us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is the key that allows you to access the goodness that God has in store for you. That's why Jesus says, be it unto thee according to thy faith. Somebody here has lived long enough now, going through enough ups and downs in life to know that sometimes faith is all you have to hold yourself together. That faith will hold you, faith will carry you through, faith will bring you out of some situations that you know you'd still be stuck in had you not believed in the power of God. As a matter of fact, on this historic moment as we celebrate the life of two great African American men, I would say that our forefathers and foremothers in heaven are living witnesses that we've come this far by faith. They used to add a verse on that, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. Because he's never failed us yet. Uh, That faith is one of the most critical components of your life. Suggest to you in part one of this sermon that kind of faith that pleases God is faith that surrenders to his sovereign will. Faith that believes no matter 
how inescapable his presence may be in your life when you don't feel God around you. There's always his power at work in you. And then finally, that faith is that which always acknowledges the authority of God in every situation that you find yourself going through. Right. So continue on today and talk about what it means to walk by faith. I want to suggest to you that faith, my brother and my sister, is not a characteristic. Faith is not a personality trait. Faith is not a sanctified degree you put on your wall. Faith is not even a possession that you have. Faith is not just a word in your vocabulary that sits in your mouth when you sit in the Alpha Street Baptist Church. No, faith, even though it is a noun, best operates as a verb. Because if faith is anything, it is that which requires and demands action. Faith is that which moves you and motivates you. Faith unsettles you. Faith shakes you. Faith calls you to stand up and do something. Faith is not just something you talk about. Faith is something that when you really have it, it pushes you and it urges you and it forces you not to become complacent in places that God has not called you to. But faith calls you to stand up on your feet and make a movement in life. I believe with my friend, Dr. Joe Ratliff, who simply said this, that faith literally translated means risk. That wherever you see faith in the Bible, you ought to translate it as the word risk. Because wherever there is no risk, there is no faith at work. Uh, for we are saved by risk through grace. Uh, we walk by risk and not sight. That without risk it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that God is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Be it unto you according to your level of risk. It is your risk that has made you hold. Risk is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If you don't reach a point where you lay it all on the line then you're really not walking by faith hear me in case you didn't catch all of that it is simple faith does not operate where there is the guarantee of victory faith only operates when there's the possibility of defeat go on preach pastor Wesley it's not faith if you've got a written guarantee that it's all going to work out in your favor. It's only faith when you lay it out on the line and know that if God doesn't show up, if God doesn't handle this, if God isn't in this, then I might die in my trying. But if the Lord's hand is on it, if God speaks to it, if God is involved in it, everything will be all right. Somebody holler, risk. If you couldn't say amen, I got my first amen from Brother Peter up in heaven. Because if anybody knew that faith and risk were synonymous, it was the disciple Peter. We see Peter at his best and his worst in Matthew chapter 14. That shouldn't surprise you. Peter oftentimes is good and bad mixed together. And Peter is the brother that can say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the same one to whom Jesus has said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. Peter's just like the person sitting in your seat tonight. Yes, he is. He's, he's a mixture of good and bad. And sometimes he gets it right, and sometimes he gets it wrong. Uh, touch yourself and say, He's talking to me now. He, he talking to me. Here is Jesus at the end of the feeding of the 5,000. The Bible says he's tired. I can imagine that when you minister to 5,000 folk over the weekend, it leaves you kind of weary, a little tired. Folk didn't got on his nerves. Matter of fact, folk didn't got on his nerves so much, he sends the disciples away. Because sometimes disciples... <laughs> can't get on your nerves. Sends them away. Tells me, y'all get on the boat, go on over there, and leave me alone. <laughs> Jesus goes up on the mountaintop to pray. The Bible says while he's praying, the sun sets and the evening comes. And about the fourth watch of the night, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., he looks out and he finds an interesting thing, that the disciples have not yet made it to the other side of the sea. Right. It's been hours 
and they still ain't got where they're supposed to be. Why? It's simple because the Bible says that there was a wind that was contrary. I need to paint the picture so that you catch this. It is a contrary wind. Meaning, Deacon Bogan, it is a wind that is blowing against the direction that the disciples are sailing in. They're trying to get somewhere, but there is a force that's keeping them from getting where they want to be. Jesus looks out from the mountain, sees them stuck in the middle of the sea. And the Bible says he goes to walk to them on the water. When he's almost at the boat, we don't know how far off, but obviously close enough for them to discern that something is coming. The disciples start looking, and the tragedy and terror of the text is that they don't know it's Jesus. They think it's a ghost, and they become afraid. Jesus has to speak out to him, and he says, Be of good courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then Peter gets up with, with, with a question and a request. Mm -hmm. Peter Essence says, is it really you? If it's you, Lord, bid me walk to you on the water. Yeah. Now, that sounds like Peter always making a bold request. <laughs> if you're going to ask God for something, you might as well ask boldly. Yeah. Peter says, Lord, let me come. And then we are drawn to really what is one of the most dramatic moments and movements of faith in all the Bible. Paint the scene in your mind, if you will. It's dark outside. The wind is blowing contrary. The disciples have been rowing and getting nowhere. They see something, but they're not sure what it is. And the disciples are trembling in fear because they don't know what the outcome is going to be. And Peter makes the request to be able to come and walk on water. And in the midst of a contrary wind and disciples rowing and getting nowhere, the sun is nowhere to be found. Peter now stands at the edge of the boat making a decision about whether he's really going to... <laughs> I've heard the Lord say come. But, but I really don't know what's going to happen when I... Now, the Bible doesn't say, but we got to assume that the other disciples were not as encouraging of this as they should have been. Because sometimes you've heard God in a way that others have not. And even disciples can discourage you from. And Peter steps, and miraculously he begins to walk on water. Now you all know the story. That's not how it ends. After a few steps, the same Peter begins to sink. It made me wonder, James, what is it that motivated his faith to walk on water and at the same time causes him to sink? How, how can he be walking and then be sinking. Okay, stay with me because it all hinges on what Jesus says to them when he approaches the boat. You, you need to hang out in verse 27 because Jesus in good Baptist tradition says three things. Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Can, can we teach for a little bit? That, that's what we come here for tonight. A little in-depth Saturday Bible study. He, here's what Jesus says. He walks up to him and he says, be of good cheer. The term he uses there is this word tharseo in Greek. And it literally means be confident. 
It means hold your head up. It means be optimistic. That, 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 that almost seems cruel and callous as if Jesus doesn't understand the context of the disciples. They've been rowing and getting nowhere. The wind is contrary. It's dark outside. And they are afraid. They got a lot on their mind. Things are not going well. They're not progressing as they should. Things are dark in their world. They've never been stuck like this before. They are rightfully afraid. And Jesus shows up, says, y'all cheer up. Because the point Jesus wants to make is that faith, first of all, requires a proper perspective. That what Jesus understands is that your perspective, how you see things, shapes your prediction of how things are going to turn out. Pause, rewind, press play. Your perspective shapes your prediction. And Jesus says, your problems, disciples, is that you have the wrong perspective of your situation and that is going to limit your ability to see what is about to happen if you simply change your perspective. I come by to tell you tonight that the greatest enemy of your faith is a negative mindset. Go on, teach, pastor. That faith cannot grow in a mind that refuses to see the possibilities of faith. Faith cannot grow when all you see is the bad, when all you believe is the worse, when all you predict is it's gonna go down like it's always gone down before. When you think ain't nobody no good, they all a bunch of liars, ain't nobody on your side, it's no reason to try all to give up now, and there's somebody to date, I understand. Things have gotten dark in your life, you've been rowing and not getting anywhere, you're not where you expected to be, but the Lord showed up tonight to speak into your life and to say to you, you've got to change your perspective, because if you were to walk by faith, you got to stop dwelling on what and start dreaming about what can be. You've got to open your eyes to unprecedented possibilities. You've got to change your negative stinking thinking and start believing that with God, all things are possible. The Bible says that when you find yourself in situations like that, here's what y'all to think about. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, don't think on the negative things, but think on the good report of God and the justness of God and the truth of God and the power of God. Think on these things. You've got to change your mindset. Jesus says, listen, I don't care how dark it's been. I don't care how long y'all been rowing. I don't care how long you've been stuck where you are. Change your mindset. Watch why he tells them to cheer up. Because he comes to them in the fourth watch of the night. Now, you, you may not understand the timing. That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Understand that that, Michelle, is not the darkest time of night. The darkest time is the third watch, between 12 and 3. April 3 to 6, the fourth watch, that's just at the break of dawn. So, so if you hold on and know that I have shown up, you got to believe that the sun is about to rise and things are about to get better. I don't know who I came to preach to, but I came to tell you that things are about to get better. The sun is about to rise. You're about to break out where you are. And that's what faith believes. 
Faith refuses to give in to a defeated mindset. Faith refuses to believe that there is no hope. Faith refuses to accept that there's not any way to get out of this. Faith does not acknowledge dead end and closed doors and locked up windows. Faith believes that no matter how dark it has been, the sun is about to rise. No matter how much I've been rowing, I'm about to start moving. No matter how many folk don't stand with me, God is about to lift me up. My faith refuses to accept a negative mindset. And maybe that's what allows Peter to walk on water because Peter, unlike the other disciples, has a different perspective. Wow, wow, wow. I heard him say, come, so I believe I can. I believe at the word of God, I can survive this. I believe I can walk on this. I believe I can handle this. I believe I can live through this. I believe I can survive this. I know nobody else has, but I heard Jesus say come. And at some point, you just got to believe you will survive. You will make it. You will endure. You will come out. You will prosper. You will grow. You will thrive. I believe I can. Now, say with me, this is why you come to Alfred Street. Because it is that same perspective that causes him to walk on water, that causes him to sink. Stay, stay with me, saints. Here it is. Why does this man who's walking on water begin to sink? I'll tell you why, because here's what the Bible says. He saw that the wind was boisterous. Okay, okay. Don't, don't miss it, saints. What he saw caused him to sink. Come on, come on. Here it is. He sees the wind. I did a little Bible study and read this passage. And there are three things we learn about the wind in these few verses. Can I tell you what it is? We learn, first of all, from verse 24, the wind is contrary. Somebody say contrary. contrary. It's blowing against the direction they're rowing in. It's hindering their progress. It's limited to their ability to go forward towards their destination. It is contrary. Yeah. And then we find out from Peter in verse 30 that the wind is boisterous. Somebody say boisterous. That word boisterous in Greek literally means to have force. It means to have strength. It means to be able to cause violent reaction. The wind is contrary. The wind is boisterous. Oh, but here's the good news of grace. We find out in verse 32 that that wind that was contrary and that wind that was boisterous was also a wind that ceased. The wind was contrary. The wind was boisterous. But the wind also meant to cease. Can I tell you what that word cease means in the Bible? You're going to love this. It means to grow weary. It means to get tired. That the wind that was stopping them, the wind that was violent, it had been violent so long and it had been contrary so long that it got tired and just gave up and stopped bothering the disciples. I don't know who I come to preach to. I know the winds are contrary. I know the wind is boisterous. But let me just be a preacher and tell you that if you hold on, hold on and live a little while longer, if you trust God, the same wind that was contrary is the wind that will cease. Mm. What makes this text so amazing? This is not the instance where Jesus was in the boat and fell asleep and woke up and told the wind to stop. The wind just gave up. I need to go old school to somebody. I just come by and tell you like the old say, she say the storm is passing over. 
And if you have enough faith to wake up in the morning, if you've got enough faith to not die in the middle of the day, I come by to tell you that you will find no storm lasts forever. That sooner or later, even the winds get tired because you just keep on surviving. Sooner or later, lying lips give up because you just keep on surviving. Sooner or later, your haters just retire because you keep on surviving. Sooner or later, everything that stands against you has to give up and quit because you keep surviving. Somebody say proper perspective. Oh, can I go a little deeper though? You got to have faith that doesn't just have a proper perspective. But watch this. You have to have a faith that discredits your doubts. Oh, God, I feel preaching right here, Mark. Jesus shows up. He doesn't just say be of good cheer. He says, it is I. If that's your Bible. Put number two right there. It is I. Keith, since you're in seminary, that, that, that Greek term is ego eimi, E-G-O-E-I-M-I. It is literally a, a Greek translation of a phrase that you have seen before. Yes, it is I is not new to you. If you've read the Bible and gotten past Genesis into Exodus, you've seen this phrase before. Yeah. Because this is the same translated phrase that shows up in Exodus chapter 3 when God tells Moses, I'm about to do a great thing in the life of the people of Israel. And Moses says, but Lord, who shall I tell them? Sent me to tell them they're going to do this great thing. God says, listen, I can't give you a name because you're going to limit me. Just tell them I am. So when Jesus comes in the middle of the sea, he gives them something they've heard before. I am which is to let them know God is right here. God is in this thing with you. The winds are contrary. It's dark out, but God is here. Amen. Now, here's the tragedy and terror of the text. They don't know it's Jesus. Now, now, now why come they didn't know it was Jesus? It's a sad thing not to recognize the presence of Christ. It's a sad thing to be in a place where Christ is there and you don't see it. I, I know you think I'm talking about the text, but that happens in church every Sunday. There are those who are so focused on the wind and the darkness that they can't identify the presence of Christ. Why do they not know it's Jesus? Well, I would suggest to you, Jim, that part of the problem is that when they last saw Jesus, he was on the mountaintop praying. Yeah. And it's hard for them, Eureen, to believe that the same Jesus who was on the mountain praying is now on the sea in the middle of the storm. Yeah. Come, 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 come on. Because anybody can have faith to hold God in majestic mountain moments. But God says you've got to have a faith that does not doubt my reality in your life when you find yourself on storm-tossed seas. Ah, you've got to have a faith that believes that God is not just with me in my mountaintop moments, but I serve a God who can come to me in the darkest of nights and a God who is there with me when the wind is blowing contrary in my life. Ah, real faith hangs its hat on Romans chapter 8 and verse 38, which simply says this, that I am persuaded. I wish I had some Bible reads that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor height, nor death, nor any other created creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That if there's one thing you ought to believe, it's that God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. It's easy to believe God is there when you're on mountains. 
But I want to talk to you about a God who shows up in storm-tossed seas. As a matter of fact, there's some neighbors on your pew who are living witnesses of some storms you have been in, and the Lord show enough showed up. Now, I ain't talking to folk that just want to holler. I'm talking about some folk that got some bona fide resume experience to success that I've been in some low valleys, and God walked with me. I've been in some storms, and the Lord brought me out. I sat in that doctor's office, and heard a diagnosis I didn't want to hear, but look at me now, because God's been there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can I teach Bible? That's why you come to Alfred Street. Here it is. Watch the tragedy of Peter. We oftentimes highlight Peter's success, but I want you to see one of his failures. Peter comes to the edge of the boat, sees something that looks like Jesus. The voice sounds like it. And this is what he says. If you're really you. Let me, if you're really you, give me authority to walk on water. Now, now, Bible students, let me tell you why this is dangerous. Because this phrase, if it's you, is the same term Satan used in Matthew 4 in tempting Jesus. For it is there that Satan says, if you're really the Christ. And Peter mimics the same language, which shows that he really doesn't know if it's Jesus. And I would suggest to you that part of the reason he sinks is not simply because he saw the wind. Jesus says, no, why did you doubt? Jesus indicts Peter on the charge of felonious doubting. Now, now, stay with me, saints. Bible. Dean Johnson, what did he doubt? He really could not have doubted that he could walk on water. Because by the time he doubts, he's already walking on water. Stay with me. As a matter of fact, he's walked on water so much, James, that when he begins to sink, all Jesus has to do is reach out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look how far he's come walking on water from the boat to the arm reach of Jesus, and he begins to sink. It's not walking on water that he doubts. He's doubting even though he's getting close Is it really you? And the indictment of Jesus is, you're wondering, is it me? Look how far you've come. Who else could it be? Look at what you've been able to do. Who else could it be? I double dare you to just think about what's been happening in your life. How dare you doubt if God is with you? You're still in your right mind. Who else could it be? Your bills are still paid. Who else could it be? You still got a job. Who else could it be? You're laid off and you ain't hungry. Who else could it be? I wish I had some folk that could declare that when you see how far you've come and what the Lord has enabled you to do, there's no doubt in your mind. There's no question in your soul. You know that it must be. It had to be nobody but God. Lord says after all you've come, in the ways in which you've walked, you ought to be able to say, you can't make me down. I know too much about him. Look at what I've done and how far I've come. It must be the Lord. Just by telling him, don't doubt him. God's done too much for you to doubt him now. 
This ain't your first test of faith. This ain't your first storm. This ain't your first group of enemies. These ain't the first folk that lied on you. This ain't the first time you didn't feel good. This ain't the first time your money ran short. This ain't the first time you wondered how you make it. And God says, look back over everything I've caused you to walk on thus far. You walked on stuff that should have killed you. You lived through stuff that you should have drowned in. You survived some stuff you should have killed yourself in. But look how far you come and you ought to be the first one to stand up and declare if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Can I help you tonight? So I come by and tell you, you got to switch your language. That faith does not say if God. Faith says since God. Okay, you'll catch that in a minute. Faith doesn't say if God will move and if God heard and if God knows. Faith says since God heard and since God knows and since God is able and since the Lord's going to make a way and since the Lord's going to sustain me, I'm going to walk in faith. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right y'all, y'all, come on, sit down. Here it is. You got to have the proper perspective. You, you've got to discredit your doubts. Oh, but let me give you the third thing. Let me give you the third thing. You've got to have a faith that not only has a proper perspective, not only discredit your doubts, but a faith that faces your fears. I'm glad y'all shouted because now we can talk. Fear and faith are mutually exclusive. You cannot be afraid and trust God at the same time. You can say it, but fear and faith cannot operate in the same space at the same time. Faith says go. Fear says no, you don't. Faith liberates. Fear incarcerates. Faith empowers, fear paralyzes. Fear will lock you in situations that God has called you out of. Fear will cause you to accept things when God has better things. Fear will cause you to surrender yourself to people whom God has called you to be liberated from. Fear will hold you hostage from the goodness and the greatness and the glory of God because you're scared about what's going to happen. Can I suggest to you that there really was nothing miraculous about Peter? What made Peter different than the other disciples was that they were scared and Peter chose faith over fear. told y'all I have a therapist and she has a slogan that made me think of this text the slogan says this leap and the net will appear don't, don't, don't miss it. that as long as you are afraid you will never see how you could survive sometimes baby Bubba you got to leap you got to step out the boat. You got to make the first step to find out that God will sustain you. Can I show you why? I'm, I'm done now. Let me show you why. Because I read this text and I realized all the time I've read it wrong. Peter did not primarily ask to walk on water. No. His desire Come to Jesus. I'm tired of being in this boat. I'm tired of the winds blowing. Lord, let me come to you. And here's what the Lord says. That when your desire is to draw close to God, don't be scared. When your sincere prayer is to walk in the will of God, don't be afraid. 
when you ask God to make you what he designed you to be, don't you worry about what folk will say and what folk will do and what folk will think when you desire to draw close to God. God will sustain you. God will provide for you. God will lift you up when you desire righteousness and hunger after holiness and want to be closer to God. God will sustain you. Can I preach it now? And even when you falter on that journey to Jesus, when you slip and stumble as you will in trying to be what God wants you to be, when you make mistakes and you shall, even though you're trying to be better tomorrow than you were yesterday, let me show you the grace and the glory of God in walking by faith. Watch what the Bible says. That when Peter lost a proper perspective, and when Peter began to doubt, the Bible says right here in verse 30, don't miss it, look at it. He began to sink. He began to sink. Which implies that there was a time lapse between the beginning of sinking and actually sinking. Come here, come here. Now the reason you ain't shout yet is because you don't remember that nothing begins to sink. If you go out to the Potomac River and throw a rock, it's not going to begin to sink. It's just going. But because Peter has put his trust in Jesus and he's walking by faith, he just begins to sink. That what should have happened didn't happen. And he didn't go down like he should have gone down. And he didn't drown like he should have drowned. I come by to preach to somebody who knows that what started didn't finish. What should have happened didn't happen. What could have happened got delayed from happening. The Bible says that while he was going down, he had enough faith to know I still got time to call on God. I still got time to call on Jesus. And when I call him, the same God that enabled me to walk is the God that'll reach down and lift me up. Hey, hey. Goodbye, Alfred Street. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I came by to tell you, while you got breath, you still got time. If you call on him and trust him and walk to him, yes, he will. The Lord will pull you up. Would you just nudge somebody and tell them you still got time? You've got time right now to call on God. Somebody today, here you are. You're beginning to sink. And all you've got to do is call on the Lord. And he will pull you out. Isn't it good to know you didn't go down as quickly as you should have? Come on, come on, come on. Yeah.